Okay, we are recording. Welcome. This is the Delmarva Woodland Stewards Landscape Scale Restoration Grant webinar on dynamic forest blocks. And we are joined by Dr. Jeff Larkin from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And he's the Forest Birds Habitat Coordinator for the American Bird Conservancy. So uh, welcome, Jeff. And the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Yes. All right. And I am in presenter mode. So you have my full screen. Yes. Correct. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. So uh, happy to have uh, been invited to share a little bit of uh, about the work we're doing in Pennsylvania and, and actually some of the work we've been doing in Western Maryland as well as uh, as part of working lands for wildlife to uh, help conserve and <clears throat> reverse the decline of the golden wing warbler. We'll touch a little bit on on that and some outcomes of that here in a bit. But for the most part, um, I'm going to, you know, you, you, you see my title slide here and you see that there's the word wildlife in the slide, but I don't have any pictures of wildlife. And largely it's because um, this is, this is the, the, these are the images and the actions that have to happen before we, you know, can, can think about conserving a diverse forest wildlife community. I show birds here, but I'm going to provide some evidence here um, throughout the initial portions of the talk to kind of get at the science support behind why wildlife uh, populations, wildlife communities beyond birds uh, as well um, need diverse forest landscapes. And I also realized that, you know, Delmarva is not nece necessarily the most, you know, we're not talking about large expansive areas of forest, uh, but I certainly think what I'll be talking about today uh, has a lot of applications uh, that, that can be transferred to, to various landscapes, even different systems. It doesn't have to just be um, forests, uh, but I think the model itself is what, uh, is, what it, is what is important to kind of convey today. So really quickly, I want to review the evidence regarding the importance of structurally diverse forests to wildlife. And then I want to highlight why foresters are key to recovering populations of at-risk species and keeping common species common. And then I want to share with you, and probably what most of you are most interested in, is share with you um, insight as to how our partnership in Pennsylvania and it's growing beyond uh, is working to overcome the many constraints that often frustrate, uh, impair, inhibit uh, the delivery of science at scales that are biologically meaningful. I'm also working from home today and, and my window is open and I have this oven bird that is just screaming at me. So I apologize if that's a uh, background noise for you, but it's kind of fitting for the uh, fitting for the talk. So like, Maryland, uh, like Pennsylvania, Maryland has uh, a good bit of forest. Of course, it's not as, as big as Pennsylvania, so we wouldn't expect uh, Maryland to have 17 million acres of forest like we do here. Uh, but certainly, you've got 2.5 million acres of public-private forest lands, um, mostly con uh, concentrated, of course, to the western part of the state, but certainly dotted throughout the rest. And like many eastern states, um, our forests, the forests of Maryland are both in, are important for both for our, you know, our natural heritage. It's places we like to go, places we like to view, see, um, or if we don't go there, we just uh, are, are happy and pleased with the fact that, that those places exist within our state. <clears throat> and of course, we also know that forests can be a really uh, important part of our rural economies. And when we lose those rural economies, we know what happens to those, you know, to those communities as well. It's really cool about our forests, and I think why so many people are attracted to our forests, the eastern deciduous forests, is the fact that they're so diverse. And um, Maryland, at its location, very similar to um, places in Pennsylvania, where you're just you're positioned right at this place where you have high enough elevation you're going to get those northern forests from the from the 
from the north kind of coming down toward you. And you're going to have those oak hickory forests from the uh, east and from the south coming up. Where those all come together, you get really interesting landscapes of both forest communities and the associated wildlife. And, and those are places that we like to recreate at, whether you're a bird watcher or a bird hunter, a hiker, uh, an angler. We enjoy going to those places. Of course, as I mentioned, the rural economies, uh, the, the fiber that those uh, forests provide for us are important. And of course, the ecosystem services that forests uh, provide us, such as uh, making sure that our water is clean and as pure as possible. All of you on this call also, or in this, this Zoom or uh, whatever platform we're using today, uh, also can appreciate the fact that these forests are threatened by the threat of the day, it seems, anymore. Invasive species, deer that are out of balance with local landscapes, uh, disease, conversion and fragmentation, and uh, perhaps the, the wolf and sheep's clothing, unsustainable harvest practices on private lands. And Eastern forest birds are one of those taxa that are uh, telling us that something's wrong in our forests. Um, they're telling us uh, that we must do better. If we look back at the 2009 State of the Birds report, you can see the uh, line for the eastern forest species. These are 25 indicator species of eastern forest. You can see that that population trajectory over the long term was declining uh, relative to the western and boreal forest uh, counterparts. And then, of course, the 2019 uh, landmark, I guess, uh, publication uh, that chronicled the loss of 3 billion birds since the 1970s. So about six of 10 wood thrush uh, that you would have heard standing in one place back in 1970 would not be heard today. So it's about as long as we have been doing wildlife science, um, forest birds have been one of those groups that we've studied. Um, and many generations of scientists before us have studied. Well, that's largely because um, they're popular, right? And they're, you know, just by these images here, um, they're quite striking. Um, they have really cool behaviors, whether, whether it be the drumming of the grouse or the, the sky dance of the woodcock uh, or the, the marvels of migration uh, as we are all experiencing um, these days. Um, or the night sign, the night calls of something like uh, a whippoorwill. And as long as that science has been uh, conducted, um, a couple of overarching themes have emerged, uh, especially uh, important to be thinking about these themes, not just in the ecology of the species, but actually in the conservation of these species. And the first is, uh, that forest birds, species, communities are quite landscape uh, context dependent, right? So it's the percent forest on the landscape, the age class of forests on the landscape, the types of forests on that landscape, right? That interspersion of northern hardwoods, uh, mixed oak, oak heath, oak hickory, um, topography aspects, and all that come with that. And then the other is the structural complexity. Think about this more uh, or less of kind of like the within stand uh, or site level characteristics. And these kinds of conditions that you see on the right side of the, of the slide here, from a bird perspective and from a wildlife perspective equals niches, right? These places have unique characteristics, characteristics for which this wonderful diversity of wildlife uh, that we that we value, we cherish, we enjoy, uh, has co-evolved with uh, over millennia. And when we lo lose that structural complexity uh, within stand, and we lose uh, heterogeneity across our landscapes, then of course, by default, we are losing niches. So the science is pretty clear that forest birds are in trouble. 
And when we ask ourselves, why are forest birds in trouble? And we have to point to the fact that yes, um, some of our forest birds migrate to South and Central America, and there are certainly uh, troubles in that part of the world from a habitat perspective um, and along their migratory routes. But not all of our, our forest birds are migratory and they are also in trouble. And there are a lot of other forest wildlife that are not birds uh, that are uh, experiencing pretty significant population declines. I'm going to run through some science that supports uh, the concept that our, our forests are too simple. Um, our forests are too simple largely because the forests of old, uh, in one mass sweep, uh, essentially, uh, we lost thousands of years of structural diversity in the making, right? Landscapes that were once completely forested, uh, covered by hundreds of year old forest where life and, and, and rebirth of trees across uh, landscapes and disturbances, big, uh, small in scale and severity um, uh, were, were commonplace. And of course, that's the kind of, of landscape that hosted a lot of different niches, uh, the niches that supported diverse and abundant wildlife communities. Well, after we <clears throat> mucked it up pretty good, um, we're fortunate that forests came back on our landscapes. Um, in Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, uh, about 17 million acres of forest on our landscape. It's about probably around half of what is estimated we had originally, but still 17 million acres, a pretty good amount. And again, 2.5 million acres uh, of forest in Maryland. Um, so we, we have to we have to at least appreciate the fact that we have forests back on the landscape. That forest all came back at relatively the same time uh, when the lands were cleared and the forest began to regenerate. Also the phenomenon of uh, abandonment of agricultural lands and the reforestation uh, on those lands through just natural succession has resulted in primarily uh, a relatively even aged forest or a forest that uh, is unbalanced in its age class structure. So it's it's these bookends uh, that we lack on our landscapes. And certainly um, the y-axis could go much higher than what it goes right now. Uh, unfortunately, we have no forests that are of that age. And it's important that we work uh, very hard today uh, to make sure that many of our uh, portions of our landscape can get to those older age classes. We have too much, and I, I want you to think of too much in, in, in quotes, right? I mean, it's never, you can never have too much forest. Uh, we just have too much of this age class relative uh, to the other age classes that you see here. It's not surprising when you look at the species that are in the most severe decline, it's those species that require or what we would call the bookends of this age class um, uh, structure. Cerulean warbler, uh, a species associated with very large trees. Um, and then of course, things like woodcock, rough grouse, golden wing warbler, and others species that um, depend quite heavily on landscapes that have a fair uh, amount of predictable uh, and sizable uh, young forest, but not just young forest as I'll show you here in a moment. So when we think about the backdrop of this even age forest landscape, and we think about all sorts of other threats, right? The diameter limit cutting, uh, AKA high grading that occurs. We see very little uh, regeneration forest management as you see at the bottom uh, of, the, of the of the slide bottom left and then thinking about the various invasive species and the uh, invasive species uh, effects that they have within these landscapes and the work that we try to do when we try to do work in these landscapes and then uh, of course our good friend the white-tailed deer uh, native but nonetheless uh, when we create conditions uh, and, and to be clear, it's when it's when humans create the conditions by which for uh, deer are are um, able to then have an impact uh, that can be quite severe. 
uh, all of this stuff comes together and um, really further simplifies the forest. And it certainly challenges uh, foresters' ability to provide some more structural complexity to our landscapes, both within stand and across landscapes. I would say research in the last 20 years uh, has been kind of a real eye opener for um, ornithologists, for forest managers, um, forest managers who are thinking about uh, forest birds as, or, or forest wildlife as being a group that um, they also need to, to be thinking about, not just, not just the trees and the regeneration of trees. Uh, and, and, and why it's uh, been such an eye-opening time period is the technology has allowed us to sneak peeks into the otherwise secret lives of, of nesting or reproducing songbirds, and that is what happens when birds leave their nest. Um, up until not too long ago, uh, all of that research that I mentioned previous is really confined to when the birds landed uh, from migration or when their courtship started and started making noise and you could follow them. You could mark them and track them and, and study them and, and monitor their nests and determine nesting success and compare nesting success and territory densities and all of these other aspects of avian ecology. Um, but it was confined to the, to the nesting period because once these birds leave their nests, uh, they're, they're quite uh, elusive, they're quite quiet. So when the technology uh, reached the point where we could apply small transmitters to fledglings uh, or, or individuals that were in the nest still, so nestlings, but days before they were to fledge, um, well, a lot of studies uh, began using uh, that technology and as late, I would say as late as the 1990s on larger species like wood thrush and then um, into the into the 2010s through 15, 16, 17s and certainly currently um, the technology got small enough that we could apply these transmitters to uh, warbler sized birds. And and what we learned was uh, quite remarkable. Here's uh, a study conducted by Cam Fiss. He was one of my graduate students uh, a few years ago. He's a PhD student at uh, SUNY ESF now looking at wood thrush and dynamic forest uh, management and avian communities. But this is part of his master's work uh, here in Pennsylvania. And what I want you to see, look at is here on the, on the right side of the slide, you see this uh, fledgling golden wing warbler image and it was hatched out of an egg in a nest uh, on that blue dot area there and um, of course they don't have they don't have uh, tails they're they're not very good flyers yet the first few days out of the nest so it takes them a little bit to to get moving uh, away from a nest site but when we track this <clears throat> every one of these yellow dots represents a daily relocation over about a 30-day period so this, <clears throat> this nest was placed in a four-year-old overstory removal. And this bird, when he left the nest, traveled up through the managed forest and then um, spent a fair bit of time in this other portion uh, of this local landscape. And uh, what you see here uh, is the work of forest managers and not, not done on, quote, behalf of golden wing warbler, but just doing what foresters and forest managers do, right? When this four-year-old overstory removal was um, completed, they actually planned uh, for a shelter wood at the same time, which is what you see that that bird um, transitioned through as it uh, entered about a 20 to 25-year-old regenerating clear cut with residuals. And you can see through the background of that transparency there, you can see uh, those residual taller canopy trees uh, from the original uh, initial forest uh, that were retained after that overstory removal. So I'm hoping you can hear this, uh, but this is uh, this is a, a female golden wing warbler. 
and she's nest building. It's a big old oak leaf. And she's going down into this patch of goldenrod and, uh, and uh, see, you can see a, a woody stem there. And then you can also see the um, rubus. So you've got a tree sapling, uh, seedling. You've got some, um, some forbs, some goldenrod. You've got this uh, blackberry stem. And, 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 and what you have here is a forest, right? It is, in fact, a forest, uh, albeit a young forest. And that is where uh, that species places its nest. That is critical habitat for this species. And now we put a transmitter on the, the, the nestlings uh, before they leave this nest. And you're going to see in this video um, life outside of the nest. And um, this is pretty cool video for a lot of reasons, but this is a video that Cam uh, recorded. You're going to see dad uh, teaching uh, the young, uh, what's going to be a male, you can see he's starting to look like a, like a, a, par a parent there, um, teaching him how to, how to eat. They eat leaf rollers, uh, leaf roller caterpillars, their bills, their, their um, ecology, their foraging ecology is particularly uh, suited for that kind of, of foraging. Um, and uh, again, I don't know if you're hearing the music off of, or the sounds off of my um, presentation, but what you heard in the nest building video that I just played uh, in the background would have been things like common yellow throats and eastern towhees. Uh, and here uh, we hear um, red starts and we hear Eastern wood peewees. Dad's really showing them how to get in there and says, now you do it on yourself here. Get in there. He says, this is not half bad, this place here. This is not like where my nest was, but I'll take it. So my point in those two slides is that the conditions that golden wing warblers are using during the breeding season, from when they place a nest to when they raise their young to independent, look can look quite different from each other. We had another student that looked at a similar, had a similar study designed for the cerulean warbler. This is Doug Raybuck. Is a student at Arkansas State, native of Pennsylvania, um, and we wanted to um, examine post-fledging ecology for cerulean warbler in Pennsylvania as well. So we were lucky to secure funding and have uh, Doug conduct this study. This was up near the Allegheny National Forest, um, and what you can see um, was a typical behavior of a cerulean warbler um, fledgling uh, after it left uh, left the nest. And this bird, in, in this case, quite interesting that, um, of course, they didn't go into the young forest, but it was very obvious that this bird transitioned across this landscape on this edge. Uh, it was in a nest that was near some of these canopy gaps uh, that you see here, which is a well-known uh, uh, aspect of, of cerulean warbler uh, nesting ecology. Uh, which is why shelter woods are uh, are often a, a management tool uh, used to promote cerulean warbler um, breeding territories. Um, once it uh, finished its moving along this forest uh, edge um, with this young forest, it actually moved down uh, this this forest road, and it used this forest road uh, edge area to actually get into some of these other managed areas. So another shelter wood and uh, a 25 year old uh, clear cut, very dense uh, canopy in those cases. So my point that I'm trying to make here for for all of this is is for these two focal species of management right now, high conservation uh, concern, where they place their nests whether it be a cerulean warbler high in a canopy next to a canopy gap uh, or a golden wing warbler at the, at the base of an over uh, of a, of a goldenrod 
stem or a rubus stem or some kind of uh, grass sedge stem uh, within a regenerating clear cut looks quite different um, where they where they actually take their kids um, to to molt to learn how to evade predators to learn how to forage and to ultimately prepare themselves for a long migration uh, to their wintering grounds in South and Central America. So it's not as easy uh, as we once thought, right? Just make some habitat. Just go out there where they put a nest, mimic that uh, habitat conditions uh, elsewhere, and you'll be able to be able to save these species, no problem. Just create the habitat. And the reality is when we think about the importance of post-fledging and the risks and the importance of that time period, we, uh, we can appreciate the fact that we have to manage our landscapes uh, much differently uh, for, from a species perspective. And I would argue from a forest management perspective, a lot of the work we do on the landscape typically is kind of, uh, well, if we're fortunate to be public land managers, we find the lowest hanging fruit and we uh, we attempt to do the work there. Um, private landowners, of course, not nearly as, as fortunate and, and they have to, to work with, they have to work with what they have um, within their uh, property boundaries to, to achieve their management or conservation objectives. But we need to be thinking about how these species use the landscape. Um, and, and I would argue that because they, they use much larger portions of the landscape than we previously gave them credit for, um, when we combine the nesting season and the post-fledging season, that both uh, public and private lands, especially when um, we're talking about landscapes that, that have these types of, in adjacency to each other, uh, really need to be working more effectively uh, across those. You know, we really need to be moving more effective, mo uh, working more effectively across those two ownership domains to be able to have a bigger uh, impact on recovering forest birds and, and certainly um, doing good things for, for other forest wildlife as well. So what we need to be thinking about is like these birds uh, after they leave the nest have a, a limited amount of mobility, right? And if we do management across a landscape and we are trying to provide these multi-season benefits, right? These habitat types that, that they use both nesting and post-fledging, but we do it at the wrong scale then we're not really having the effect that we hope to have. If we're creating those dense sapling thickets more than a kilometer away from an overstory removal that has nesting birds in it, then it's likely not nearly as effective as it would be if we had a very similar uh, stand that was within 700 meters of that particular um, nesting habitat. And it's not just golden wing and cerulean warblers that display this um, shift of, of habitat use uh, once they leave the nest. The, the, re the research is, is pretty clear, pretty strong out there for a number of species uh, that we need to be creating mosaics of forest age classes and structural condi conditions with a matrix, important, with a matrix of mature forest, right? It is how we maintain a pipeline of all forest age classes. It's also how we get old, old forests back on the landscape. Um, we could argue for much of our landscape, we're halfway there. Um, we have to be careful not to not be halfway there. We also have to recognize that we need to we need to figure out how we're going to do that in the context of providing for uh, early successional communities, providing early successional communities for those species that are dependent on that. Uh, so here we have the wood thrush. Uh, our, our data suggests that in large tracts of mature deciduous forest, a mosaic of early and mid successional forests along with mature riparian forests will accommodate both the breeding and post-dispersal habitat requirements of wood thrush. 
Forest management for whippoorwill should consider harvest strategies that maintain the availability of regenerating patches in close proximity to mature forest. Note that neither of those, and the saying there's a, another uh, several studies on oven birds uh, that showed a very similar trend. No, none of them say need more old forests, need more young forests. It says that the, the stressed points here is the heterogeneity and the adjacency, the proximity of these different structural attributes, if you will, uh, to each other. And it's not just forest birds. If you look at native pollinators, uh, a number of studies that have been done, uh, conducted recently and published uh, that look at the benefits of younger forests uh, to native uh, pollinators within, again, a matrix of older forests. Uh, bats, uh, quite a bit of work uh, done that, that uh, introduces this concept of, of a shifting mosaic or, 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 or providing a diversity of, of conditions to meet diverse bat communities' uh, needs. And then, of course, meso carnivores, whether it be Fisher in Pennsylvania or a bobcat in the Southern Apps. And all of these pretty much kind of share. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like they all copy and paste the last paragraph. I swear they all kind of have this similar um, ending uh, uh, in some way, shape or form. You'll find something that reads similar to this. However, it is, it is apparent from a number of studies that these three species may benefit from heterogeneous forest landscapes, such as those created by active forest management, when heterogeneity encompasses forest type, age, and structural characteristics. So I would argue, uh, if we go back to ninth, my, my ninth grade English class, where Mr. Furlow had us read Rhyme of the Ancient Air, uh, Mariner, I had no idea why at the time, but I've come to appreciate at least this saying, um, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. And I would think that there are a lot of forest wildlife out there that are, are essentially saying the same thing. We're fortunate we have forests on the landscape but we need to do better to make sure uh, that, that those forests are, are being um, maintained in a way that meets the needs of diverse forest uh, wildlife community. And of course, we know it's not just about birds. It's not just about wildlife. If we look at forest action plans, um, it's, very, it's pretty clear that um, that in in the writings uh, of these plans we see statements like this a lack of, of of diversity in age classes and successional stages changing overstory species composition threats from biotic and abiotic vectors as well as poor management practices reduce uh re reduce the health and blah 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 i can't read it because there's something over the screen uh a forest and produce poor habitat for native wildlife, forest action plans. 2015 science uh, was all about forest health, particularly um, good article in there, got at the definition, a refined definition of what forest health uh, should be. And it reads, thus a healthy forest is one that encompasses a mosaic of successional patches representing all stages of the natural range of disturbance and recovery. Such forests promote a diversity of nutrient dynamics, uh, cover types, and stand structures, and they create a range of habitat niches for endemic fauna. Would argue that there's um, certain truth in the statement that what is good for forests is good for forest wildlife. It's all about scale, adjacency, amounts, and all of those other things that need to be considered when we manage our forests. Of course, foresters um, know how to manage forests. Um, the science of silviculture, um, it's what they do. As long as foresters are provided opportunities to use all the tools in the toolbox, 
and this is public and private lands, right? If they have the ability, capability, they're allowed to use all the tools in the toolbox to manage forests uh, for forest health, um, good things will come for forest wildlife. Of course, we know this takes funding uh, to be able to do this, and sometimes it takes considerable funding. Um, and sometimes uh, that funding is attainable, uh, especially if you're working on public lands, and sometimes it's more challenging to come across those funds, particularly for private landowners. But nonetheless, uh, lots of lots of, uh, of things are coming online for private forest owners these days to help them uh, regarding financial and technical assistance uh, to, to better manage their forests. This is a stand enrolled in working lands for wildlife in Western Maryland. Um, gosh, I challenge you to find uh, anything other than an oak seedling in this regenerating forest. Um, this is a stand uh, that was uh, a mature forest stand that was treated with prescribed fire. It may never have its canopy uh, cleared, uh, but certainly the next time we have some kind of a canopy disturbance here, uh, we can be fairly uh, confident that the stand that would replace the, uh, the current stand probably will have some oak in it. So, you know, lots of lots of folks say, well, you know, we got all this forest on the landscape, you know, it's going to get old, let it just let it get just let it get old on itself and, and the species will figure this out. And, and I wish I could say that that was 100% what we could do. Uh, but I would argue that the cerulean warbler, uh, if he or she could speak, would um, say that that would not be in their best interest, nor would the golden wing warbler. Um, you see their population declines over the last 40, 50 years, and you can see that they do not have another 50, 100, 150 years for our forests that we goobed up long ago and continue to goob up today. Uh, they don't have that long. These species will be lost from our landscape. So we have to keep forests on the, on the landscape. That's the first thing. I think certainly all of us on this call can appreciate that. And we also need to be good stewards of those forests. We need to be good stewards of those forests. Um, and that means we sometimes need to do things that at first don't look very nice, right? Whether it be uh, a low shade removal, whether it be an overstory removal not long after it's been conducted, a prescribed fire, a shelter wood, even yes, taking this, you know, <laughs> wonderful green carpet of fern, treating it with herbicide and seeing real results, right? This is a real before after photograph from some of the, the work we're doing here in Pennsylvania on some of our dynamic forest blocks. So we need to be better stewards of our forests. The days of just drawing a, a boundary around a forest and saying that it is a forest and therefore um, we're, we're good, move on to drawing the next boundary around a forest. Those days have passed. Um, there are too many threats to our forests. Uh, we at least need to be more responsible in recognizing when we need to have some intervention. Not saying that every square inch of forest should ever be managed, but we certainly need to recognize that not doing anything is most often not uh, the right choice. So here's our conservation canvas for eastern forest birds. Um, and my world is mostly the, the central Appalachians um, from Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, Virginia, down into Western North Carolina with some of the work I do. But we can think about this conservation canvas having two uh, primary um, um, forest types, right, uh, from an ownership perspective. Private lands, which is the majority, nearly 80% of that landscape, and then public lands. Um, those public lands being a minority, but certainly play a really important part when it comes to, to thinking about conservation of forest birds and wildlife from an anchor, an anchor perspective. The ability to sustain uh, forest cover types on the landscape, age classes on the landscape, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that here in a moment as an example. 
So our group began um, back in 2011 with the completion of uh, the Golden Wing Warbler um, uh, action plan and some of the um, BMP guidances for that particular species, so species-specific uh, habitat recommendations. And we started as the Pennsylvania Young Forest Partnership. And I can tell you that the Pennsylvania Young Forest Partnership only was the Pennsylvania Young Forest Partnership because that's where a lot of the money was uh, available for us to do the work we wanted to do uh, through things like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's Young Forest uh, Keystone Initiative. So we took the advantage of those um, uh, uh, of this emphasis on young forests, the fact that the golden wing warbler was being petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. We formed a partnership. We still had one missing variable, uh, but we had a desire. We had a, a long-term goal of creating young forests on the landscape to benefit the golden wing warbler. We just needed more of this. And that's where we went uh, to work uh, focusing on first. We needed that money to be able to overcome capacity limitations. So who's going to do the work, right? All of us are tapped out. Um, who's going who's gonna to be uh, really kind of focusing on this question, this need uh, every day without any uh, interruptions? Who's going to fund it? Uh, the work we do in the forest is not by no means um, cheap. Uh, and when we start doing this work at scale, it becomes relatively ex expensive pretty quickly. Uh, how are we going to overcome the different outreach mechanisms that are needed to communicate with different forest ownership types? Private landowners are communicated with differently than public uh, forest managers. And then, of course, we needed money um, from a young forest perspective to keep up with the never ending cycle of succession, knowing that we didn't want to develop a program where we would keep um, setting succession back in any one given place. Rather, we wanted to um, rotate these forests uh, across the landscape, across time. And that's where Working Lands for Wildlife gave us one big break, uh, 2012, when the golden wing warbler was selected as one of those eight species. That provided uh, financial and technical assistance to private landowners in that tan area of the map. So basically across 10 states, Eastern states, the Appalachian range of the golden wing warbler. And we were lucky to secure funding from NRCS and National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And we had, uh, of course, we had Shannon Farrell in, uh, in the Western part of uh, Maryland and Matt Rowley before Shannon. And that allowed us in, in, in our foresters in, in Pennsylvania, uh, as well as Virginia and North Carolina now. Um, and actually we added New York and Vermont uh, recently, uh, whereby we have an opportunity to basically have a, a, a turnkey operation, if you will, where we work with landowners, uh, identify uh, shared objectives. If they have places on their property that are uh, suitable for a project, then uh, we will do all of the, the, the civil cultural uh, dotting of the I's and crossing of the T's, help those landowners implement that project, uh, be on that site with uh, both the, the landowners to be able to make sure that projects are going as planned uh, according to the conservation plans. Uh, and then we sit back and we're able to watch uh, these forests uh, regenerate into really structurally complex uh, forests uh, from a young forest perspective, but also thinking about what these forests will look like in 15 years, 20 years, 100 years um, before the next rotation. It will be quite structurally complex. All of uh, that work, the financial assistance from NRCS, as well as the technical assistance that we provide, uh, along with the agency, uh, private land uh, foresters and biologists that are also involved in this work have resulted in uh, over 450 landowners, 23,000 acres uh, of, of uh, golden wing warbler, uh, young forest habitat created, and that cost $14.4 million. Now, you know, 23,500 acres sounds like a lot, but when you consider the fact that you're spreading that across 10 states, a huge geography, 
uh, it's a lot of work um, and uh, quite diffuse across the landscape. Um, we also uh, assisted with the RCPP for Cerulean Warbler. Uh, and you can see the metrics for uh, Maryland uh, at the bottom of these slides for both, both of these programs. Um, and I should point out that um, Maryland should be proud of itself here because it's one of the smaller states with one of the smaller geographies for these two species. And um, year in and year out, it was a state that was taking advantage of these two programs. I'm going to move along pretty quickly here because um, I, I see that we're a little bit uh, rushed for time. Uh, we monitor these uh, sites uh, that were enrolled in Working Lands for Wildlife and similar uh, efforts on public lands. And what we found uh, over a pretty intensive um, uh, three-year um, monitoring effort was about 30% of our golden wing warbler sites were occupied. And we might think, yeah, 30% is not that great. but when you consider it's a species being um, that is under consideration for Endangered Species Act, um, it's 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 not to be expected that you would have really really high occupancy. Understanding why those occupancies uh, were low, or maybe better yet, figuring out how we can improve occupancy is a really important uh, part of of why we monitor. And one thing we found was that um, no sites that were were enrolled in the program that were greater than 20 miles from a known golden wing population were occupied. And more importantly, 99% of all occupied sites were within 8.5 miles of a known breeding population. So what happens for a species like golden wing warbler that's already rare on the landscape uh, is that these private land projects are conducted across space and time. And remember, succession is not the friend of the golden wing warbler from a nesting perspective. Uh, so what you likely often have are sites that are too far from a source population, that are too far from each other, and they're too far spaced in, in time uh, to actually have golden wing warblers um, establish. Uh, breeding territories. That's where the public land piece, or even, even thinking about not public land, but um, private lands that are under easement or um, just large private lands, uh, tree farms, uh, other programs uh, that put these, these forests uh, of, of high value and protection are really important uh, to be part of, of this conservation solution, if you will. When we place a large block, um, what we would call a dynamic forest block here in Pennsylvania, when you place these on the landscape and you start to think about, all right, now I have this private lands program um, where, where I might focus my efforts initially on these sites that are close to these anchor points. These anchor points are important because land managers can manage for a diversity of age classes. They can uh, promote populations of a species like golden wing warbler. Those individuals produce source uh, uh, individuals uh, through successful reproduction that have a greater chance of uh, occupying sites uh, nearby. And remember the magic 8.5 miles for golden wings. We're really lucky um, when the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation started unrolling about five, six years ago tons of programs that really stress the diversification of forests. Um, the Young Forest Partnership magically transformed into the Dynamic Forest Partnership. There is no Young Forest Partnership. And we, no one was sad about that either. I can promise you that um, because this is the kind of stuff we were hoping to be able to do all along. Thinking about how we can manage blocks of forests across uh, concentrated landscapes to meet age class um, structure and, and diversity uh, goals for both foresters and forest wildlife uh, biologists. It all starts with a plan. It all starts with uh, a comprehensive plan where we try to, for perpetuity, um, plan how we're going to get a mix of age classes across these landscapes. 
Um, and you can notice over a 15 year first planning uh, phase, we get some young forest on the landscape in this particular example. Um, you can see that 40 to 80 year old dropped uh, uh, quite a bit and it's not because it was all cut, it's because it's advancing to the older age classes. And still yet you see even in 15 years from now, we don't have greater than 125 year old forests on this landscape, but we certainly will. And, and maybe the next 15 year cycle will do better. Uh, I'll skip through this one for now. This one is just a scary perspective of what we have in the overstory in most of our blocks and what we have uh, as kind of the suppressed midstory, aka what would become an overstory if the stand were to be hydrated, for example. We monitor these sites. Every red dot on this is monitored uh, for birds, uh, twi visited twice per year. Uh, we've conducted over 2,200 point count locations. And these are really important because they provide us baseline metrics for our three focal species, but also for our um, avian community in general. And we can use this information in subsequent years to compare once we have done a bunch of implementation. The lion's share of the $3 million we have, um, we have been uh, successfully awarded by NIFWIF goes into the management, to the stewardship activities within these dynamic forest blocks. We're at over 300,000 acres of dynamic forest blocks uh, as of a recent grant. Uh, and we have great partners, um, both public and private uh, land blocks. We have great partners that are doing great work to implement sustainable forestry practices and to identify those places that are going to continue into older age classes as well. These uh, are blocks within the Poconos region. Um, and you can see uh, these blocks have orange polygons within them. Those are areas that have been um, that have had some form of forest management, forest stewardship activity since we initiated this program uh, five, six years ago. I kind of move in on one of them, an 11,000 acre uh, dynamic forest block. You can see where we've done work since uh, the last six years. A lot of this is preparatory treatment or just forest stand improvement type treatments prescribed fire, hay scented fern, invasive species, low shade removal, with a little bit of overstory removal or shelter wood harvest uh, happening within these uh, landscapes. We treated about 15,000 acres within those 300,000 acre dynamic forest blocks over the last five years with lots of projects ongoing right now. And we've it moved and advanced uh, our work to actually form partnerships with companies like Domtar in Northwestern Pennsylvania. Um, paper company uh, needs low grade volume. Of course, we know that um, low grade, you know, that wood is, uh, is really important to be able to get out of the, of the forest, if, especially if we want to prevent high grading on private lands. We need a place for that so that we can successfully regenerate forests and successfully um, manage our older forests um, to the conditions that we would like. We need to do more of this. Uh, we need to find ways to work with private landowners, with industry, to be able to achieve the conservation outcomes that we hope to achieve. Um, we're using, in the last couple of slides here, we've advanced our monitoring efforts uh, to be quite high tech. Uh, when you start getting up to 2000 some odd points, it's pretty hard for humans to visit all of those points twice in a given year. So we do a little bit of the rotations with human observers, but also at every point for two years, we put, uh, or for the first year, we put autonomous recording units uh, at every point that I showed on those maps. And those allow us to really uh, investigate and monitor and develop baselines for diverse uh, avian communities um, that would take many, many trips to these sites in a given season uh, to get the data that we're actually getting. We're using LIDAR, a project that we are collaborating on uh, with the University of Maryland. Um, and this project is about finished, but linking our bird data with forest uh, LIDAR metrics and thinking about how powerful that tool is 
when we take thousands of landscape uh, points across a landscape that has been managed or not managed. Um, and we think about how those LIDAR metrics um, inform bird distribution and abundance uh, values. I've said a lot here. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful. Uh, I think it's sometimes it's really depressing to think about the declines of our forest wildlife and the threats that are uh, ever emerging and growing every day. But one thing is clear, um, habitat initiatives for wildlife have been marked with successes. Um, we have the wetland restoration efforts that really began um, with, with any kind of considerable strength uh, in the mid 1980s uh, with wetland restoration efforts. Think about the, the uh, Kirtland's warbler and the recovery effort there that, that led to the delisting of that species. And just think about the patience that we had to have here. Think about what would have happened if Kirtland's warbler conservationist stopped here and said, you know what, it's not working. Uh, but, but look what did work uh, in time when they met that kind of magic threshold of habitat. I think the same holds true for forest birds, although the challenges will be grand. Uh, we will need to find ways to focus our efforts and to kind of work out uh, in kind of concentric uh, rings, if you will, from known populations, a similar approach that was done for Kirtland's warbler. Uh, we're going to have to learn how to work uh, even stronger between public and private ownerships. Uh, but I'm pretty certain that if we can do that, uh, we can have the successes that those other programs have had. Um, and, and communicating, of course, with each other and sharing our successes and lessons learned is going to be an important part of that. Uh, I'm going to leave you. I'm hoping you can hear this. Uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, just a few um, sounds from the sites that we actually uh, have been monitoring and had these ARUs at. So these are recordings uh, captured by ARUs in our managed uh, dynamic forest blocks. So a uh, whippoorwill. Great, frog, great tree frogs. And I thank you for your uh, time and, and listening, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Awesome, Jeff. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, you know, anybody that has any questions, uh, you can either type it in the chat or you can unmute and talk or raise your hand. That may be easier if there are multiple people wanting to have questions. Um, real quick, in case you need to go, any foresters on the line, if you need your SAF credit, just send me an email after this. I've got the chat sending me a list of everybody that was here. And so as long as you're on that list, uh, I'll be able to, to, to make sure you're on the list I send to SAF. So with that, uh, we'll spend the next up to five, 10 minutes taking questions. Yeah, and here's who I am. This is my face uh, and I have a cat that's gonna be driving me crazy in a minute. I hear it starting to come up the stairs. So I'm gonna be on mute until I answer some questions, but um, uh, I just wanted to give you a, a face with my voice and um, and I'm happy to to stay and talk as, as long as you'd like me to, to stay and talk. Go ahead, Luke. Go ahead, Luke. Hey, Jim. Luke McCauley, University of Maryland Extension. Um, sorry, I'm going to mute myself. I have two two audios going on here. Sorry about that. Um, thanks for your talk. Really interesting. Um, I 
I find myself wondering a little bit also where um, you listed a lot of important forest species. Where do you see the dynamic but fitting in also with our grassland species and how to tie them into this system? And, and perhaps it's more of an ecoregion issue where more more coastal plain areas might have more of these grassland species. But I'm, I'm curious if you see a role for how to tie all that together and in, in with this work too. Can you hear me? Ah, my fault. I was be I was answering your question on mute. Sorry. Right. Um, there's, <laughs> I'm, uh, I do that too. Used to the, I'm getting used to the organization here of what all this looks like. So, um, the answer, uh, great question, and um, the answer is uh, absolutely it fits in. A matter of fact, uh, NRCS has uh, talked to me uh, previously about you know how do how do we get the dynamic forest concept into dynamic agricultural landscapes uh, and thinking about and thinking about um, you know in my a little bit of my previous life when I was in Kentucky I actually um, studied grassland birds more than I did um, forest birds henslow sparrows and grasshopper sparrows and horn larks and dick sissels and you think about all of those grassland bird species they all are very much like our um like our forest birds they all have very particular grassland structural microhabitat characteristics right you never find a henslow sparrow with a territory right next door to a grasshopper sparrow they like very different kind of degrees of grass thickness if you will same with uh horn larks and meadow larks and things like that so how how we manage landscapes for heterogeneity is really going to be the, the trick for a lot of species moving moving forward and groups of species moving forward and when we throw the i have a graduate student that's working with um nrcs and private landowners in wisconsin and minnesota for pollinators uh, monarchs in particular and looking at how monarch uh, uh monarchs are responding to the young forest work that's being done on the behalf of golden wing warbler and, and woodcock in those states it's really going to be important to to kind of make sense of how all of these species are are responding to dynamic uh landscapes so i know um i know that in pennsylvania we have some areas near the letter kenny uh area uh, not far that's pretty much just north of you guys for which um they're essentially trial running this dynamic grassland agricultural landscape. Um, and I think that a lot of the talk within RCS is uh, in relationship to um, managing these local landscapes for heterogeneity that promotes Bob White recovery, uh, which is uh, gonna be pretty important. Long-winded long -winded answer to your that's question. A good, that's a good answer. and. Um, Dan Small at Washington yeah, College here locally is involved with some NRCS working lands for wildlife uh, work on private land. Um, and there's a lot of similarities and they'll be part of our landscape scale restoration grant as well. Awesome. Um, uh, so one of the questions from the chat uh, yep. is you posted the uh, showing the golden wing warbler had like an eight mile uh, range of how far they were from already preoccupied places yep. um, is it is is that pretty much the same for cerulean is it the same you know you're getting success is better when it's near source populations yep. so great question gwen good to see your name and um read your text here um yeah it's even uh so here's uh i, I don't want to end with too much gloom and doom here but um if i if i needed to make a wager on which species was really in serious trouble um the cerulean warbler or golden wing warbler both are but if i had to pick one um the work i've been doing over the last several years with respect to cerulean really um makes me not too hopeful for that species uh it's certainly going to be a species that is so very dependent on public land conservation um the 
the answer is cerulean warblers. Um, I had a, a student finish. Uh, he monitored 139 of the RCPP golden wing warbler sites. A, we only had 13 sites occupied by cerulean warblers out of 139. Um, and um, the biggest predictor was close uh, dis distance to a known cerulean warbler uh, population. Uh, it was 2.5 kilometers, very, very short distance, um, much, much less than that eight kilometer for the um, golden wing. But more importantly, um, the fact that cerulean warblers, we know need large trees, large diameter trees of um, oak, tulip, uh, white oak, tulip poplar, hickory, sugar maple, all of those trees that everybody wants to harvest uh, off of their private lands if they're going to do a, a harvest, uh, especially when there's no um, low grade market. So even though many of these lands were enrolled in, in the RCPP, the size of the trees and the species composition um, were just not what cerulean warblers need. Um, particularly the size of the trees. If we can't, if we can't find a way to, to grow species that cerulean warblers like to the size that cerulean warblers like on that 80% of the landscape uh, that is owned by private forest owners, I just don't have much, I hate to say it, I just don't have a whole lot of hope for the cerulean warbler. All right. So uh, also in the chat, um, a question about occurrence data, because so that we could look up uh, if we have a place we wanted to see occurrence data where we might be next to a, a known sorority and white. Eh, I can never say that mm -hmm. a known golden wing site or whatever, um, so that we would know if we were in those uh, bands of eight miles for a golden wing or two miles yep. or. Um, Whatever. So, but yeah, Bob was wanting to know about uh, where can we find occurrence data to prioritize management. Yeah. So um, it needs to be updated. It won't change too much, but it will change a little bit. But we actually have uh, what's called the uh, priority areas for conservation for golden wing warbler. It's actually what um, NRCS field offices use to rank their uh, golden wing warbler applications. And that was based off of occurrence um, forest type. Um, it was a outcome of a of a GIS um, exercise we did under Working Lands for Wildlife to uh, help to help confront this issue of just too diffuse across the lands, you know, too diffuse across the landscape with these private lands projects. So I can uh, I'm happy to share that shape file. Um, it it is um it is available for maryland as well well i was going to ask about extent i didn't know if that would come all the way to the shore or not well your golden wing warblers are going to be um any chance of a golden wing warbler is going to be limited to your western two and a half most counties that's right sorry so, <laughs> yeah allegheny washington and um, um garrett yeah but um but I will tell you this, that um, <laughs> you, you, the, the, the work being done on private lands, whether it be in the RCPP or the Golden Wing Warbler Working Lands for Wildlife program, um, provides great evidence of the diversity of forest birds that Maryland has. And certainly you can extend that all the way to the shore um, logically. Um, for example, prairie warblers, my gosh, I mean, um, just unbelievable numbers of prairie warblers that show up on sites managed for golden wings and and that's um you know that's a species that uh is is not doing well everywhere as well so um just lots of opportunities uh to do good things for wildlife no matter what your geography is when we think about using the best available forest science um in the best available wildlife science and kind of putting those two things together for sure i think there's another maybe another 
comment? Yes. That uh, Maryland is in the process of doing a breeding bird atlas that will provide some of these data and update existing data. That's mm -hmm. good as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good to know. And Luke McCauley has also found eBird to have more sightings than in iNaturalist. And I believe you may be able to get sightings from the annual birding, breeding bird survey. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and we use a combination of our own data and, and eBird data. And, um, and uh, if it was current, we used some of the state, some states breeding bird atlas data to develop our packs as well as data from other partners um, for, for the Golden Wing priority areas. Um, what, what year is Maryland in for their breeding bird atlas? I'm just curious, by the way. I hope Gwenda knows because I have no clue. 20, okay, so it's in, it's, it actually is in process now. Okay, cool. Um, and then I see uh, there was a comment in there about identifying places to do dynamic forest uh, work. Well, um, for me, uh, the the default the default was um, where where I had partners with a base of partners that had very similar, um, I guess, goals, shared vision, um, desire to be active uh, in, in making, you know, in making an attempt at this. So I would say start with a combination of two things, find places and partners that, that have that. And then if you can tie it to a geography in a, in a group of taxa that you can use as kind of a, a benchmark of, of monitoring uh, successes. I would I would go with that. I think that from the Del Marva perspective, uh, you uh, was it maybe was it Luke? Maybe it was. Yeah, I think it was Luke's question. Basically talked about you know those non forest block landscapes where maybe you have forests and maybe you have ag lands and maybe you have um, some other mix of, of, of working landscapes that you could select and not just be focused on forest birds or, or forests per se, but just a, a healthier landscape, a landscape that has that mix of, of working forests, working lands and, and everything else in between. Um, but you know what, for, for the work that we've been doing in in Pennsylvania, we've recent, recently added like, oh, probably 20,000 acres of private um, forest land to our dynamic forest blocks. Some of these are large private landowners. Some of them are foundation lands. Uh, some of them are hunt clubs uh, that own 4,000 acres, but they but they are adjacent to like a game lands or a state forest land. Sometimes they're adjacent to each other. And they've just... Uh, they just have a strong desire to do good things for their forests and to do good things for the, the wildlife that inhabit their forests. Um, where, you know, and, and they often come looking for us, um, which is pretty cool. Um, when folks are sending you an email saying, hey, I heard about this dynamic forest partnership thing. We own XX acres next to XX block. How can we, can we be a part? Um, I think th that's how you ultimately grow these successful landscapes. Um, and when you do that, you can tell a pretty good story. And when you can tell a pretty good story, you start to get um, consistency in grant funds uh, that are made available to you. And I think that um, between the Delaware River program, the um, the uh, Chesapeake Bay as well as the central apps. And then of course the Chesapeake wilds um, program uh, recently, um, uh, RFP is recently over, but Maryland sits in a pretty darn good position to 
to draft some proposals to fund some really amazing work. Uh, it's just it's just getting down to the business of identifying those places and uh, writing the proposals. Excellent. All right. Well, that uh, that concludes the question and answer portion. And uh, Iris, you can go ahead and turn off the recording. Maybe.